One of the benefits of going last is you can uh, get revenge on the previous speakers. But I, you know, I'm taking the high road here. I have nothing but wonderful things to say about Tom Overton. Um, probably what I would really like to acknowledge, although I think she just walked out of the room, is Heather White. Uh, Heather White, as, as Tom said, I think is one of our new kind of like superstars. Um, and she occupies my office, so my old office. So, so when I see that, you know, that just gives me more reinforcement to get the heck out of the way, retire, go fish, hunt, let the young ones come and take over because uh, I thought that was just an outstanding presentation by Heather. Um, the presentation I'm going to make right now is I think actually the last, the last presentation I created as an employee of Ball Chem. Um, and it's, it's based on an analysis that I actually did a couple of years ago. And, you know, I, I tried to tell the, the ball camp people, hey, this is, this is good stuff. Um, but they never, they never took off on it. Uh, they, you know, and I, so now I can, now I'm going to slam somebody, right? Um, I, you know, the marketing people just didn't go for it. And, you know, I, I don't know whether it's too complicated for them to understand or whether they just thought it was too complicated to put into some sort of a marketing piece or whatever, but for whatever reason, um, it didn't get presented until, until last fall, late last fall for the first time. So um, I'm going to present it to you today because I actually thought it was sort of good stuff. I will tell you right now, it's, it's the most commercial presentation I ever made while at Ball Chem, and, and so that's your... You're forewarning. This is a little bit more on the commercial side. So if you want to get up and leave and, and go eat lunch or, or whatever now, or what, fine. But, but what I did was to, to wrestle with this question of, you know, if, if, we use, if we use choline on a farm or we recommend it to dairy producers, you know, how, how confident are we in... in the fact that, that they'll actually see a positive response. So we'll, we'll start off this presentation going back to my academic years. And I'll give you some sort of an idea of how, how I uh, kind of approach things. In my academic life, I, I was interested in fatty liver. And I spent, in fact, my first graduate student came on board and I said, all right, we're going to figure out, you know, why cows get fatty liver. And, and the student worked with my colleague, Lou Armentano, to, to actually use liver cell cultures to try to figure out factors that regulate how much fat accumulates in the liver. So, so I was interested in this fatty liver thing right out of, right out of the gate. Um, so... Early on, we conducted research to identify ways to, to reduce fat in the liver. But at about 10 years into this process, yeah, I started to get a little annoyed about this. Um, my question was, well, what are the biological ramifications of fatty liver? I could very easily see me spending the next 20 years of my career studying ways to reduce fat in the liver of a dairy cow, but it got to bug me after a while, so at the end of the day, you know, what does that mean? I mean, does that really have any practical implications to the dairy cow? And basically, on, on the end, end, you know, the sort of end result of the profitability of that dairy farm. So it got to me. It got to me. I said, I... If I'm going to study this for the rest of my career, I need to know, you know what are the ramifications. So we started considering in vivo models for studying what the ramification of fatty liver is. And the bottom line is none of them, none of them fit the bill. None of them, none of them would work. So for example, you can induce fatty liver in a dairy cow by overfeeding it grain during the dry period. 
So one of the things you could do is, well, why don't you use that as a model? Overfeed grain during the dry period, induce fatty liver, and then study what are the ramifications of that versus a control group. You can, but you're confounded. I mean, you're confounded out the wazoo, right? Because even though that feeding additional grain may have increased liver fat content, it had lots of other changes in that animal as well. So any resulting carryover effects you might see during the lactation could be due to a number of things, including fatty liver. Same thing. You can induce fatty liver through feed restriction. But when you feed restrict an animal, you do a lot of other things in the animal as well. So if you look at the ramifications of feed restriction, it's not just you know increased liver fat. You could take a group of cows and split them into two, those with low, low liver fat versus those with high liver fat, and compare them. What effects it has on reproduction, animal health, whatever. But you're still confounded because you might have created two genetically different groups of cows. All right, Different body condition score. You could take a group with low versus high body condition score. We know cows with high body condition score are likely to have more fat in the liver. But there's a lot more things in the animal of a, or in the cow that's low versus high body condition score than just liver fat. So you're totally confounded. So we then went back to these in vitro models where you, you work with cell cultures. And much like the work that Heather was describing, we took cells in culture and we exposed them to different levels of fatty acid in the media. We induced fat accumulation in the cells and then we looked at how they functioned. And sure enough, in some of our studies, we saw that liver cells with fat had less gluconeogenesis, lower rates. Well, that's a pretty big deal, right? The liver is pretty well needed to make glucose from propionate, and glucose is needed to make lactose, and that drives milk volume. Pretty important finding. These cells with fat in seem to have less ureogenesis, lower conversion of ammonia to urea. Well. Ammonia can be very toxic to the animal, so that was seemingly pretty important. These liver cells with fat seem to have a reduced hormonal responsiveness. Uh, that would seem pretty critical. And lastly, reduced synthesis of protein. So at that time, I was good. Okay, at that time, I was good. I said, ah, at least I've proven to myself that these cells with fat in them probably are not functionally the same and there's probably some detrimental effects. So that gave me the green light to go ahead and continue studying fatty liver. And I did. Okay, now here comes the career change. I have my midlife crisis, you know, maybe later than most, but it was about age 55 and I said, I need to do something different. So I went to work with Balchem, and all of a sudden I'm kind of hit with the same deal, right? So I could go out and tell the choline story, et cetera, and it reduces liver fat. But you know what? At the end of the day, producers did not get paste based on a percentage of triglycerides in the liver, right? Ugh. So I'm back into this sort of same conundrum only now it's, it's more from an economic standpoint. When you feed ruminally protected choline, it increases the diet cost. No questions. So what are the benefits and what are they worth? Well, especially when working with commercial dairy farms, it, boy, it's, it's pretty tough to measure that kind of thing on the dairy farm. You'd like to say, well, you feed this, you might see you know, more milk, better health, better whatever. But you know, the reality is it's difficult to measure those things on a single farm because of changes, more confounding factors. Things like changes in management, forage quality, herd dynamics, herd facilities, et cetera. So at the time it was, how does one provide confidence to the nutritionists or their producers and perhaps even more importantly to myself, what are the chances for success when utilizing, in this case, the Reassure product, right? Romantic protected choline. Um, you, know, you know what my first response was? First couple of years I was working in the country is just don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. 
They didn't, they didn't hire me to do that. They hired me to be a transition cow expert, to talk about the biology of the transition cow, to talk about the biology of choline and cetera. Don't worry about it, but just like in my academic career, you know, after a while it starts to rub on you <laughs> that at the end of the day, if you're going to have a clear conscience, you, you got to come to grips with this. If you're going to be talking about even the biology, the implication is you should use it, well, what, what's the chances for success? Well, I went through an evolution on this thing. Um, and I'm going to go over the evolution of it. The cost per day at, you know, a couple years ago, and I can't even really tell you what it is now, but 35 cents per day, I think it hasn't changed much. So that's pretty high relative to the, some of the other supplements that are used in, in, in dairy uh, ration formulation. So one of the things that we thought about there for a while was, well, you know, the reassure is only recommended to be fed, is not recommended for the entire lactation, it's only 42 days. 21 pre, 21 post, well, if you take that total cost, it's about 17, 18, or 14, 15 bucks, but spread out over a 305 day lactation, that's 4.8 cents per day. Oh, that number sounds a lot better, right? Yeah. So, yeah, well, the problem is, you know, it's still a cost. It's still a cost, like it or not, it's still a cost. All right, the next thing I did was I went to some of the people at the University of Wisconsin that work for the Center for Dairy Profitability to get some information on what it, it costs to produce milk. And the data that they had at that time, and this was, this was probably, oh, I would say this would be probably 2008, 2009 data. So it's a little antiquated. But at that time, the cost of milk to produce 100 pounds of milk was 1550 for 100 weight for a cow producing 22,000 pounds of milk. I think they use that number because that was maybe the average production in Wisconsin at the time. This cost per cut weight includes the cost of raising the animal, labor, facilities, interested in borrowed money. It was to try to be kind of a comprehensive cost. So you, you do the math, and that ends up an investment about 3,400 bucks per lactation. It's going to be more than that if the cow is called earlier than average. It's going to be less than that if the cow is cows called later than average, but on average it's about 3,400 bucks. Well, again, if you assume feeding the reassure is 1470 at 35 cents a day for 42 days, if I take that 1470 and divide it by 3410, that's 0.4% of the total investment. <laughs> I'm going, whoa, that's that's pretty trivial on the one hand. Um, how I justified it is, well, we got some pretty cheap insurance there, don't we? But you know what? It's insurance. And, and so the question comes back, is it needed? Plus, this is something that people can pretty easily purge out of the system rather than you still got to raise the animal, right? And you still got to have a facility to milk that animal, et cetera. There's a lot of costs they can't purge. This is one that can be purged. Okay, so then one of the projects that they asked me to help on, and this is probably after a year or so with Bulkham, was, well, let's come out with a ROI spreadsheet. Well, to show you how near naive I was at the time, I didn't even know what ROI meant. So, you know, I was pretty stupid, right, on this economic stuff. Uh, they explained to me that's return on investment. So I pulled this one out. This may be, this is in some of the ball chem literature. It's based on Jose Santos's work when he was at, at UC Davis. But basically, you, you say, OK, what's the value of any improvement in milk, health disorders, bring into feed, feed costs here a little bit. And then you look at your, your return versus your investment, and 4.1 to 1. So that, 
you know, that looks pretty good. That's getting kind of closer to what, you know, might satisfy me. I, I thought it looked pretty good. That, that seemed like a reasonable approach. There's some, some criticisms you can make of this kind of technique. But I thought, in general, it sounded pretty sound. We were at an event that was put on by Balcam, and I think it was actually Kim Kesey who actually presented this. And it was a group of nutrition consultants, and one of the nutrition consultants in the front row said, ah, that re return on investment, that doesn't mean anything to me. That's, that's nonsense. And he went on to explain why it was nonsense. He says it assumes the herd obtains the average response, or the same response that the, the, the Santos study got. Or he says even if you pool it across studies, it, it still assumes an average response. And he says, when I'm out advising clients, I know that they're not all going to get the average response. Some are going to do better. Some are going to do worse. ROI does not bring in any sort of concept of risk. And he says what you need to do is, is you need to figure out a way in which you can tell me that if I'm going to use it on a farm, what, what the likelihood of, of getting a response or having success or having it be profitable. Good point, right? Good point. Back to square one on this thing. So after that, I went. You know, I went back to the office and thought about it a little bit more. And, and I seem to recall when I was at the university, Randy Shaver doing some, some sort of analysis with, with one of the products he was working on at the time. And so I, I called Randy and he said, oh, yeah, 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 we did that when we were working with, actually, it was, it was yeast. Um, and, and so I asked him about it. He said, oh, yeah, that's, we used a methodology published by Dave Galligan, Journal of Dairy Science. And if you want, I can send you the software that he provided to me for doing this analysis. So I said, oh, sure, that's great. What this analysis does is it, it, it kind of brings it into our statistical context of type 1, type 2 errors, uh, kind of a modification of that. But in this case, a type 1 error is using a product when the production response is below the break-even point. All right, that's a boo-boo. You're using a product and you don't break even. That's an error, right? Alternatively, a type 2 error would be not using a product when the production response is above the break-even point. In other words, if you would have used it, and you would have been one of those herds that does above break even, it was a boo-boo not using it, right? So this, this dairy science article goes through the analysis where you can actually determine the likelihood of making either a type 1 or a type 2 error, as well as, as well as an associated cost. So this isn't, this isn't Roomly protected choline data. This is just this is just a graph actually out of that article. So what I'm I'm just doing is to try to convey the concept here. But basically the concept is on the y-axis we have the frequency in which a response was obtained, and the x-axis is that response, in this case, milk response in pounds per day. So the principle is if you use a product on herds, again, some of them aren't going to respond. Some of them are going to be towards the high end and have actually the, the greatest response. And there's going to be everything in between. And it's probably going to be normally distributed. And essentially what this analysis is doing is you, you can say, OK, how much milk do I need to break even? So that's this, this line right here, this vertical line there. That's the amount of milk needed to break even. So that's taking into a cost the cost of the product, any changes in feed intake, as well as any milk response. The area under this curve, then, 
corresponds to what he's calling the type 2 error, or the frequency of the type 2 error, namely not using a product when the production response is above break even. The area under the curve on this side becomes your type 1 error, or the likelihood of using a product when the production response is below the break even point. To put it another way is, in this example, there's an 87% chance you're going to do better than break even. There's a 13% chance that you're not going to break even. All right. Clear? Okay, our marketing people didn't get it, but, you know, I see a lot of heads nodding, so that's good. Okay, so, you know, what information do you need? Well, to get the break-even response, you need the price of milk, right? Any changes in feed costs. For this example, I'm going to use the price to reassure. And any changes in feed intake. But you also need this frequency distribution that we just saw on the last graph. Right? That's, that's sort of the, the critical factor. You need enough information to generate sort of that response curve. Well, I had that because as, as part of my uh, due diligence at, at Bulkham and I had done a meta-analysis on 13 studies that had been done in transition cows with ruminally protected choline. So basically, a meta-analysis, you're probably all familiar with that. What you're really trying to do here is to pool data from multiple studies to increase your power of looking at whether there were treatment differences or not. I was a little bit surprised when I did this. I actually found 13 of these studies. Tom went over several of them. But there are actually a total of 13 transition studies. 12 of them measured, uh, or 12 of them fed choline both pre and post fresh. One of the studies fed pre fresh only, and in that study it happened to be the heifers only. But I used that study as well. Feeding prepartum began anywhere from minus 7 to minus 28 days. It varied depending on the study. Most of them started around three weeks prepartum. Feeding postpartum, we had the one study that quit at calving. The rest of them, I think, went anywhere to feeding two, two weeks or 14 days postpartum to 140 days postpartum. All right, so values from each study were used. These values are weighted, OK? They're weighted based on basically the size of the study. If it's a bigger study, it gets more weight. If it's a smaller study, it gets less weight. That probably makes sense. If a study has more replication, we have more confidence in it. If a study has less replication, we're least, less confident. OK, so here's the 13 studies, all done through universities. A couple of comments. These ones in pink are the ones that have been done for, with product from Bulkem. The ones in gray are done with products that are not produced by Bulkem. So this is, full disclosure, this is, this is every study that I could find involving transition cows, feeding of choline. The only criteria to make this, this group was that they had to start feeding at prepartum. All right? So this is the doses that were used, the duration of the study, how many experimental units, whether there's multi-paris cows, premium paris cows, or a combination of both. Of these 13 studies, 11 were done in university settings. Two of them were done in commercial dairy, dairy herds. All right. But they were, all, they were all either studies that had been published or had a manuscript in preparation that I was able to get the, the needed information from. OK, so in this, in this study, in this meta-analysis, there's an increase in postpartum dry matter intake of 1.6 pounds per day, highly significant. So that has to become part of this analysis. They're, it's costing more because the cows that are fed the choline actually eat more. Milk production response was 4.9 pounds per day. The p-value on this thing was less than 0 0.0001. And when I saw that, I went back to my statistician 
friend at the University of Wisconsin. I said, I think we've done something wrong here. That can't possibly be. He looked at the, you know, the SAS commands, et cetera, and said, no, 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 it's, it's, it's OK. You're, you're OK. Um, plot out the data and take a look at it. So I plotted the data out. These are the 13 studies. Each line represents a study. So for example, here's a study. They had two doses, a zero. They all had a control. And it looks like they had a second dose, seven and a half grams of, of choline per day. So this is actually the amount of, of choline, not the, not the amount of product, the amount of choline. And so you can go across these 13 studies, and the, the reason this value is 0.0001 is because the response is very consistent. Okay? It's extremely, extremely consistent across these studies. The only time we're really getting into some noise here, there's three studies, for example, that had multiple doses. Um, and that's the Overton study that you saw earlier. I, I don't know why we're, I told I wasn't going to take any shots. Doggone it. So I lied. I, I don't know why we're getting noise in some of these multiple dose studies, but I think part of it is because when people run a trial with multiple doses, eh, there's a tendency maybe to put fewer cows on for treatment. But that, that doesn't explain all of it, but that may be part of it. But come on, generally, just an amazingly consistent response Okay, that gave the, the p-value of 0.00001, right? Across, uh, again, full disclosure, different products, different countries, different management systems, different feeds, different genetics of cows. All right, fat yield up 0 0.2, 0 0.254 pounds, protein yield 0.167. There was no significant difference on milk protein percentage or fat percentage, it increased slightly, but it wasn't statistically significant. But mainly because of the milk yield response, there was protein and fat yield responses. Energy corrected milk, if, if you do it, the math, it's 5.9 pounds per day. So we have our response curve. And we can now bring this back into this Galligan University of Penn type 1, type 2 analysis. So what I've got on this chart is looking at different values of milk and different feed costs. And it assumes, it assumes feeding reassure, the cost of reassure, and a 42-day feeding period and a milk response for 90 days. Okay, So that's, that's some of the assumptions that are put into this analysis. So let's take a look at it. Worst case scenario, Milk is very low. Feed is very high. That puts us into this square. This number here says you need 2.29 pounds of milk to break even. Based on the response curve, you're at 83% likelihood of breaking even or better. All right, So 83% chance of winning the game. If you come up to a very high price of milk, and a low feed cost, the very favorable situation, you need 0.92 pounds of milk to break even. Your likelihood of breaking even or better is 90%. Okay, so this is, this is sort of what that consultant was wanting. You know, what are my chances? What are my chances of, of doing better than, than break even? Okay, you can also come up with a cost of making these errors. So again, we have low to high milk price, low to high feed cost, type 2 or a type 1 error. So again, let's, let's go to kind of worst case scenario, low milk, high feed price. Your, your cost of making a type 2 error is that's not using the product when your production response probably would have been above break even point. That's, that's costing you 20 cents per day based on our, our 13 studies. That's going to cost you 20 cents per day by making the mistake of not feeding it. Conversely, if we come up to low feed cost, high milk, you don't use it when based on those 13 studies, you, you know, would have had a pretty good likelihood of, of beating break even. That would have cost you 66 cents per day. Pretty pricey. Now, conversely, the type 1 error, 
that's not, or using the product when, wow, you would have been one of those unfortunate herds that, that didn't break even. What did that cost you to make that mistake? Yeah, basically one to two cents per day. So that's a pretty low cost associated with that type two error. Okay, a couple of caveats on this analysis. This analysis assumed a 42-day feeding period. Those 13 studies were not all done with a 42-day feeding period, all right? Um, so I'm, I'm using studies that have used kind of a wide variety of feeding ranges, but I think we're okay, all right? Even though they, they varied, what I did with this analysis is I looked at the studies that had fed either 30 days or less postpartum versus the studies that had fed more than 30 days. And there was absolutely no difference in milk yield response, suggesting that feeding longer doesn't help. At least, and the reason I broke it at 30 and not, you know, 21 is that it's basically what broke the, the data set in half. Half of them were about above and half of them about that were below. So I just compared those two and it didn't seem to matter how long it was supplemented for. The milk production response was the same. Okay, another caveat is I assumed a 90-day production response. Well, not all of these studies were 90 days, right? There was variation in the length or duration of the trial. So maybe, maybe I'm being a little liberal here in saying that the response is going to be for 90 days. Um, but I, would, but I would argue I'm probably being conservative because I don't, I don't think the response is going to drop to zero at day 90, all right? We know from a lots of different studies, looking at a lot of different inputs, that if you can get a cow to peak more in milk, there's going to be a carryover, all right? And that, that's going to carry over to the end of the lactation. So I'm going to argue that I'm actually quite conservative by using a 90-day production response. Um, only considers milk response, all right? Um, there may be other benefits. One of them might be animal health. Tom says, and I agree, that the responses have been not uniform. There have been some inconsistencies. But in some of the studies, there have been reductions in cases of subclinical ketosis. And I even am going so far as to show one of your latest studies, Tom, published in the March Journal of Dairy Science, where they looked at hyperketonemia using a 1.2 millimeter cutoff. They cited in this article that previous studies have showed a 40 to 60 percent incidence during early lactation. They're saying 289 bucks per case. All right? And you say, well, part of that's milk, right? I mean, I mean, part of it's milk. You're double, well, of that 289 bucks, only about 30 bucks was due to, to lost milk. So there's a lot of other costs that are associated. So this analysis I'm doing is just milk, okay? No, no health. The other, the other, you know, criticism, wow, these were university herds, right? Well, two of them were commercial, but you're right. 11 of them were university herds. So does that apply? Well, <clears throat> I would say, again, this is actually fairly conservative because I think most of these herds were, you know, above, manage, above average management. These weren't herds with problems. They haven't been picked out because they're fat cow problems, downer cow problems, whatever. They tend to be pretty well managed herds. And I'm not going to show the data today, but, but Balcom actually has a data set now collected out of commercial herds on farm sort of type trials that shows really the milk production response is almost the same. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that the data set and the basis for the data set is pretty good. So quickly in summary then, the chances for sex, success are high when using rumenly protected choline. The cost of choosing not to use rumen protected choline is, is likely to be, you know, fairly high. Fairly high. So with that, Mr. Kesey. Yeah, right. I work with a lot of dairies that are around 100 cow size, have one group, do them all. What do you do in that situation? And is there a negative effect of feeding them for, say, half a lactation? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a common, you know, common situation, right? What do you do? Um, you put it in for the entire lactation, you know, in my opinion, you don't. Um, and there's sort of two reasons for that. One is more of a biological. I mean, I don't know whether one of the speakers went over, I mean, choline is a host of different things in the animal, but, but in my mind, the deficiency occurs really during this NEFA tsunami on the liver, okay? I mean, and once you get beyond 21, 28 days, that, that's pretty well subsided. Um, so that's one reason. The other reason is this, the 30-day divvy shows, you know, not really additional production by feeding it longer. That said, Tom Overton did show the study with Rich Erdman, which was in mid-lactation mid cows, and there's some abomasal infusion studies where there have been responses, okay, but again, it was pretty inconsistent. It's not, it's not like with the transition care. So I generally don't recommend, you know, in a one-group TMR for the entire lactation to, to feed it to all cows. Sorry, sorry, gang, if I've stepped on toes, but that's, that's life, all right? I just, I never have. I didn't when I was an employee. I'm not, I don't now either, okay? So. A quick follow-up, Dan. We do have the opportunity to use post-up here. Is there an advantage of doing yeah. the post-up cow and not do the post-up? Yep. Post Great question. I'll, I'll make one more comment about the post-fresh. If... And you know, you may say this is kind of a stretch, but in, in if post fresh, if there's a pen and it's a small herd, sometimes people will know which cows are in earlier lactation. If you top dress it, you know, put it in front of them, they will eat it. All right. So there's there is maybe a way. Okay, pre-fresh. The question is what about pre-fresh only? If you take a look at that, that data set, <laughs> there was only one. And that's all there is. The only thing that I can tell you is, is that that Balchem has, I think it's 65 herds now that they've monitored the herd prior to feeding, and then I is it to, I think they have to use it on the farm. I think it's for a 90-day window. The point is that some of these farms fed only pre-fresh, some fed pre and post. And amazing, out of the 65, none of them just fed post only. But we do have about a third of those fed pre only, and about two thirds of those fed pre and post. And again, this is not controlled studies, it's not peer reviewed or anything, but that data would suggest that the benefit in health parameters on these farms is actually very similar feeding pre and pre and post both. The milk production response, again, is very similar to these university studies. Our average here was 4.9, and I think it's like 4.23. You get about about 65% of that if you do pre only. All right. So again, this is not peer reviewed. It's not controlled. It's just you know a lot of commercial herds that have been on it. So I think you, you can get some, but not all of the milk production if you go pre only. That is based on 40 day, 42 days of feeding, and it's assuming a 90, the milk response average that was basically seen, I mean, it's assuming a milk production response for 90 days. I mean, there's a distribution in milk responses, but it's assuming that that distribution will be in effect for 90 days, and then at the end of 90 days, you know, it's all, all goes to zero. But, but your cost of feeding goes to zero, too. So, 